part of my role, I work at the Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion. Um, and my role is really about supporting students from underrepresented backgrounds in accessing and succeeding um, in higher education. Um, I think institutionally, we're, you know, as we started discussing today, we're all at a pretty interesting time where there's conversations happening around, like, you know, financial sustainability, um, restructures, et cetera. And I think this is a really important time to have a conversation around continuing to make sure that we are having good practice in the space of reward and recognition for students. Um, these things can fall off as we start talking about budgets um, and, you know, how to be sustainable in our work. So um, there has, I guess, at UTS been a growing emphasis on increasing student engagement through student voice activities, which is a really positive thing. Um, the challenge with that is how do we make sure that that process of student engagement and student voice activities um, remains inclusive and what does good practice in that space look like? Um, so we are developing a good practice guide to inform student voice activities across the institution. And the good practice guide is really set to acknowledge um, the value of students' time, their skills and experience by pro providing appropriate recognition for their contributions. Um, it is about, I guess those recommendations are really about supporting institutional consistency and standardization and equity in compensation for students. Um, so as I walk through my slides, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the traditional custodians of the various lands from which we are joining on today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of the land. I'm grateful to be joining from Dorog land on the, in the Blue Mountains, um, where learning and education has been happening for over a thousand generations. So just to give you a little bit of context around where this work came from. So um, UTS in 2023, uh, we started working on what's called a financial inclusion action plan. So essentially it's a whole of institution approach to support the financial well-being of students. Um, we did that in partnership with an organization called Good Shepherd, who provide a framework um, that's based on evidence that was produced by the Centre for Social Impact at UNSW and includes a process through progress verification, evaluation, and public reporting of results. Um, so what we did as an institution was essentially come up with a commitment um, to take some strategic and practical actions to improve the well-being of our stakeholders, um, and that was students for us. We went through um, a process of consultation to develop what our action plan would be moving forward. So it was a six month process to develop our foundation fee up. Um, and that included things like workshops with stakeholders, workshops with Good, Good Shepherd. And that was really about understanding what our current state was at the university, um, the risk and triggers that we have to financial vulnerability, um, identifying actions to improve the financial well-being and financial resilience of students, and also to source organisation accountability and commitment. So what's really good about the framework is that it's not just a strategy, it's actually an action plan. And so there's actions that are developed with timeframes and accountability attached to them. Um, in terms of how we defined financial well-being in the context of the fee app, so it was about being able to meet current and ongoing expenses and commitments, being financially comfortable to be able to make choices to, to allow one to enjoy life, feeling secure about financial future and having resilience to cope with financial adversity. Um, and that aligned with, um, I guess, the four focus areas of the fee app which was around, and these are what the FIAP tries to address. So it's around products and services. So are we providing safe, affordable and appropriate products and services for students? Financial capability, are we building financial knowledge, skills and capabilities across campus? Um, understanding financial vulnerability. So have we identified appropriate tools and resources to support those who are financially vulnerable? and economic security. Do we have a safe, inclusive environment that supports financial wellbeing? 
Um, so we went through this process of um, consultation with staff and students and developed this action plan. And one of the actions that came out of that FIAP was around developing recommendations to inform the remuneration provided to students involved in student voice activity. And this came up really strongly as a discussion point for students. Student voice activities are happening everywhere across campus and they're really varied, um, but there wasn't a lot of consistency in how they were defined and how students were recognized or rewarded for their engagement in those activities. Um, so when we were doing our consultation with students, um, there was a few key themes that kind of started coming up around this around this action item. So there was a need for increased standardization in reward and recognition practices across the university and the tertiary sector. Um, and that was really around the conversation was around helping to maintain equity for students. Um, and then prevents discrepancies in reward and recognition across the institution. And so um, students were having conversations that all students, regardless of the activity, should be receiving fair and standard compensation for their time and effort. Um, the next thing that came up was around equitable compensation. So systems for student engagement should provide opportunities for every student to be able to present views on issues that affect them the lack of reimbursement for some of these kinds of student voice activities was seen as a barrier for some students, and that was particularly for student groups from underrepresented backgrounds, or example, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and if students are not able to actually participate in those kinds of activities, it can exclude their voice from being reflected in things like evaluation, um, in things like revisions to policy or practice that might result from those kinds of activities. So it's really important that the reward and recognition practices allowed a whole, like a diverse range of voices to be, to be included in those processes. Um, what else came out was there was no one size fits all. So there's a really large variety of types of student voice activities across the institution, ranging from really light touch to like leadership based student voice activities. Um, and so there needed to also be a variety of different kinds of reward and recognition and levels of reward and recognition to align with that. Um, and then also what came up was that reward and recognition can take many forms. So that reflects the diverse ways that students contribute to the university community. community and they were things like monetary and non-monetary types of reward and recognition were both being valued by students in discussion. Um, and another big theme that came up as part of that consultation was around need for transparency. So um, students wanting to know what kind of reward or recognition would be, um, I guess, provided at the outset of their participation so that they could make informed decisions around whether or not they would engage. It also would help to hold the university accountable. So by saying, you know, you get a gift card or whatever it is for, for engaging in this, it also supports accountability for practitioners. So they're the kinds of themes that started to come up. Now, um, we, so from that, we started developing or pulling together this good practice guide. Um, the first thing that we started looking at was what we need to understand or get an, get an understanding of what kind of student voice activities are actually happening across campus. Um, now, as a broad definition, we are defining student voice as activities or meaningful engagement with students' lived experience. And that can include activities that might be in the teaching and learning space, but also maybe activities that involve um, different or other aspects of the student experience. So it could be um, for instance, interactions with policy or institutional processes. Um, so we did some scoping of the kinds of activities, um, extremely varied. So we had things like surveys, students involved in panels and webinars, storytelling and interviews. So that could be for the context of, um, you know, perhaps they're doing a scholarship, an interview about a scholarship they've received and that gets used for marketing material. Um, being involved in focus groups, working groups, being on council and committee. Um, and so what we started to do in our guide, which unfortunately is not live to share, 
It's with our legal team at the moment getting final sign off, but it's looking good and should be ready soon. Um, but the essentially we started to outline and provide different primary characteristics of each of those student voice activities to help define and standardize them. So um, those kinds of categorizations included um, the nature, the length, um, the level of responsibility that students might have in each of those activities. And using that can help to inform or define the kinds of reward and recognition that would be appropriate as a first step. So the kinds of things we started asking ourselves about each of those activities, well, are they, are they one-off activities um, or are the students expected to work towards a defined outcome? So to have multiple touch points, um, is preparation or follow-up required from that activity? Is it opinion-based or are they, so they're just sharing their own opinion or are they representing the cohort of students when they're engaging in those activities? And how long is the commitment? So that's the first thing we looked at, just understanding what the student voice activities are and the different characteristics they each have. Um, and then we started to look at the student engagement in each of those activities. So it's really around their level and depth of participation um, and how that can vary across the different characteristics of each of those activities. So um, this might this image might look familiar to some of you. So this was actually based on um, the Student Voice Australasia, Australasia Student Engagement Continuum um, with some changes to suit um, our context, but it's looking at, yeah, the, the shifts from a student's engagement in an activity where it might be very light touch to a high touch leadership engagement responsibility in an activity. Um, and using that continuum, so ranging from that minimum to higher level of responsibility or leadership can again help to define what kinds of rewards and recognitions would be appropriate based on the specific roles and contributions. So um, then we started looking at the types of reward and recognition. So um, as I mentioned earlier, it came up that reward and recognition in many different forms is valued for, by students. So it doesn't always have to be monetary. Um, so the kinds of things that came up are things like formal recognition. So, you know, just getting certificates and awards, academic credit, public acknowledgement, informal recognition. So it might just be a thank you, a verbal acknowledgement or a recommendation letter, monetary rewards, gift cards or vouchers, stipends or honoraria or scholarships. Um, and things like non-monetary rewards, so professional development, networking opportunities, and access to university resources. Um, so if we're using that, I guess that spectrum of what is the activity, how involved a student is in that, that activity, um, it allows us to kind of start looking at reward and recognition and how deep our reward and recognition practices need to be for each of the activities. So recognizing the level of engagement. And that starts to inform our good practice in that space. So um, basically what we're looking at is firstly, determining the nature of the acti activity. Secondly, con considering the level or depth of the student involvement and the impact of their contribution. And three, actually understanding what the student's preferences are themselves as they can also be varied. Um, so when we're looking at assessing the nature and scope of the activity. That's where we're looking at things like the time commitment, the complexity and the skills required. So time commitment, the amount of time that a student's involved in participation in that activity, and that includes any preparation or follow-up times. Um, activities that require more significant time investment, such as participating in university committees, developing initiatives, leading projects, um, might warrant more of a su substantial type of reward and recognition. Um, if you've got a student just doing a survey, again, you're looking at lower levels of engagement, low time commitment, so you can have lower kinds of rewards and recognition practices attached to that. Um, also looking at complexity and skill level, so the responsibility and expertise required of participants during that student voice activity. So are they doing, do they have decision-making res responsibilities? Um, do they need specialized skills? 
Uh, is the student providing an individual or represent, representative opinion or contribution? And then also looking at any out-of-pocket expenses that might come from engaging in those activities. So um, things like, are you asking them to travel to a different location? Um, do they need to purchase their own food? Um, and committing to kind of reimbursing those types of expenses can also help recruit a more diverse cohort of students as there aren't of then you're covering the out-of-pocket engagement or expenses for that. Um, the second part is around considering the level of student engagement. And that was looking again, using that spectrum as a really good tool, tool to do that. So firstly, is it ongoing or a one-time activity? So ongoing, regular participation on things like panels or advisory boards. Um, you might want to consider things like a combination of formal and informal recognition to motivate and um, acknowledge a sustained effort for students. Um, for one-time contributions, such as you know, engaging in a focus group or an event, a small monetary reward might be sufficient. Um, and then leadership roles on that engagement continuum, if their participation falls on that high end of the spectrum, again, we want to be making sure that that's recognized and valued through our reward and recognition practices. Um, and the third thing is understanding student preferences and needs. So um, students' individual circumstances and preferences can really vary greatly, and that's what came up in those consultations as well. So things to consider were um, students' personal and professional goals. So, um, you know, you can actually engage students in conversation around their personal and professional aspirations, and some might actually prefer um, career-related reward, rewards such as internships or networking opportunities, while other may value more highly academic credit or monetary rewards. So you can actually have a conversation with a student around that. Um, financial need, so students with financial need might prioritise monetary rewards and scholarships, um, while others may appreciate more non-monetary rewards. So again, I think that's really about having a conversation and bringing the student into that process when you're developing your practice around um, reward and recognition. And then there's cultural and personal values. So just recognizing that you should be sensitive to cultural and personal values when determining rewards. Um, some students may prefer recognition that aligns with, aligns with their personal values, such as public acknowledgements or opportunity to contribute further to community. So again, it really goes back to actually bringing the student into that conversation around what's what's going to work for them and be valuable for them in terms of reward and recognition practices. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, when we put the guide together, um, at a minimum, what was what's recommended is that students are reimbursed and compensated for their time associated with participation. So you know, if we're, that's a good starting point to think about how much are we engaging students through this practice, um, how deep are we expecting from them, and then putting a value onto that. Um, and that's kind of what we're, what we focused on in the guide. So in terms of our next steps internally for us, we are very final stages of the guide. It has been developed. Um, what it includes is I guess a matrix or a table that includes um, the types of different activities that exist. And it's a non-exhaustive exhaustive list, but the types of student voice activities, um, where that fits based on their characteristics on in that continuum, and then some recommendations around the types of re reward and recognition that could be given for that. Um, there's also a step-by-step -step guide for staff to follow um, in terms of good practice. So things around making sure that it's built into your initial budgets and processes and planning up until how you actually facilitate that um, within the university. And I guess beyond this guide, we're also looking at establishing a financial wellbeing community of practice, which will be cross-institutional. So um, this has come out of the fee app, but also I think it's come out of a lot of conversations I've had with different practitioners this year as we've been developing this guide and different things to do with VAP, um, but there's just not necessarily a space to share practice um, in the context of financial wellbeing specifically. 
and yeah just just a space for us to do that cross institutionally so if that's something that people are interested in joining um, that will be starting up next year you're very welcome to just send me an email and I can pop you on the list for that as well um, but that's kind of where we're at so I don't know if anyone has any questions um, or thoughts or opinions I mean, while I've got you here, one of the challenges that has come up in the process while we've been developing this guide is that um, way to define or separate it being something that is a reward and recognition versus formal employment. And so that's where our legal team got involved and just how we ha how we make sure that we're really clear about that in the guide so that we're not necessarily leaning into it being an employment relationship. Um, Libby? Hey, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, one oh, of yeah. the things we find here at Curtin is staff, um, you know, want to be able to usually financially uh, reward their students. It often comes down to their funding and their budgets. Is yes. that something that you've come across, you know, with, with your research and exploring how you actually do this? Yeah, it has it has something that's been raised on, um, I guess, from different practitioners across within our institution, but also across institutions. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think in, as part of the guide, what we recommend is that really in your early project planning, it should be built in. If you're wanting to have student voice as part of your project, um, your reward and recognition practices should also be built into your project plans. And if you're doing you know, grant applications or budget applications that you're considering that as part of part of those processes as well. Um, and then there's also recognition that not every reward has to be monetary. I personally am of the opinion that we should be providing financial um, support to students as much as possible and in recognition of their contribution, but it's also not necessarily always feasible and not always what the student wants either. So you know, can we provide professional development and training that can support students? Um, you know, what kinds of other recognition can we provide that's, you know, also valuable for students where there's budget restraints? Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Anna? Um, I just want to say thank you, Sarah. That's fantastic. Um, and similar to your response to Libby, um, we've really started uh, encouraging staff to build it into the project budget mm. when they're budgeting, costing out a project, even even if it means that there's going to be um, less project budget for other types of salaries and, and things like that, that um, the student reward and recognition, um, you know, makes it into the budget every time. My question was, um, is the intention to make it compulsory for all staff to put this into practice or oh, is it just going to be a best practice approach? Com compulsory now is a, is a, would be a very challenging thing to do. I think that would be the aim, um, but we are going to do it somewhat light touch in that it's introducing um, this is a good practice guide and hopefully doing some monitoring and evaluation um, across the institution just to see what the take up is. Um, we have involved our senior leadership as part of this process as well in terms of making sure they're on board. So hopefully that also supports and helps, um, I guess, being able to socialise and leverage leverage it across the institution a bit more. Yeah. But, yeah, compulsory maybe eventually, um, but right now it's a good practice, guide. There's, there's, we yeah. can drink. <laughs> you've, you've packaged to get it together really well and I, I like that it's it's led by the agenda of the, the fee app, I think. Yeah, that really gives, rather than just being a student voice best practice, it, that linkage gives it a lot more um, drive and momentum. Yes, yeah. And we're doing an official launch for our outcomes for fee up in February, which allows us to launch this alongside it, which I think is a good, um, a nice way again to just get more institutional buy-in. Thanks. Sorry, Sarah. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Quick question, and I may have missed it. I did have to take a phone call. Um, your communication plan, what does that look like about how you're communicating this out further? Yeah, so we're doing it um, so a couple of ways. So we've got a um, a group called LX Lab. I don't know what an equivalent would be at another institution, but it's kind of a staff-facing um, news-type hub. 
So we'll be doing it um, through them. So publishing an article through that through that particular hub to socialize it. We've also got our launch in February of the fee app. So we'll be socializing the launch of this good practice guide alongside that and also distributing through senior leadership. Um, that's our starting point. And so I guess we'll see what take up is through that and then hopefully um, be able to socialize it further, potentially through, you know, staff onboarding, that this becomes part of like their onboarding package and things as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Kate. Hey, thank you so much. Um, it's fantastic and kind of, I think, gives us a lot of momentum to kind of push through some of these ideas ourselves in our own institutions when we've probably been kind of sitting around on the edge going, how do we actually do this piece of work? So it's a great format. Just wondering if there's any evaluation component woven in, like probably unlikely, but co could be quite interesting to see if student like are, are you looking to build uptake of students considering your overall kind of role of, um, of like underrepresented students or students that don't always participate or is it sort of yeah I'm just interested to know um with the evaluation what we are looking hopefully getting is a sense of what the engagement with this actual good practice guide is from um staff so practitioners and academics um whether or not it's very challenging to get a sense of like what the student landscape is for student voice activities and what the take up is because it's been it's been so um yeah non-standardized I guess across the institution so people are you know calling on students some are giving them contracts some are giving them gift cards some are doing nothing it's just like it's a very it's quite a like interesting environment so really hard to track the number of students that are engaging um, ideally, we would be able to do something like that. I think when we do our launch in February, um, depending on what their up, the uptake is for continuation of evaluation alongside the fee up, we may be able to push for some more evaluation in that space. Yeah, it was a really hard ask. I just thought, you never know, it's just so <laughs> impressive. Maybe you're like raising the bar really, really high. <laughs> Thank you. <Sarah. laughs> I'm trying. It's, yeah, it's a yeah, interesting space, really interesting space just because of the variation. But yeah, I certainly welcome anyone that's interested. I, I really hope I'm able to share this guide when it's published um, more broadly. Um, it will have a UTS context right now in its current form, but I think there's information that will be very relevant cross institutionally. And if you are interested in continuing conversations around this kind of work, you're very welcome to email me to be part of that um, network moving forward. Um, Libby? Yes, yeah, sorry, I've got another question. Um, so please include me in that network um, moving forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just curious in that researching with students as to what they actually would prefer, what, did you, was it looking at students both that are doing um, student partnership and voice work in curricula and also in co-curricula? Was there a difference in maybe what you were, the data that was coming in? At Curtin, we have a lot of student partnerships both in curricula and um, co-curricula um, and I'm just curious if you found a difference in what students were looking for. Uh, that's a good question. We we did work with students that did student voice activities across both. Um, however, we didn't actually separate it to determine if there was a difference across those two different cohorts of students or two types of engagement. We were more looking at activity-based, um, I guess, engagement rather than whether or not it was co-curricular or curricular. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that's maybe an interesting piece of work, and I can see if I can if I can get that data or not. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. I know that we did an informal, um, like a, a feedback uh, station in the library once. It was only about a couple of months ago. Um, as students were walking in, you know, um, just to gather some information, and we got a variation on what students were looking for. You know, was it financial? Was it maybe we have like a what we call curtain extra, which is a formalized co-curricular recognition program here at Curtin. Are they mm -hmm. looking for that? Are they looking for something? And it actually appears on the academic transcript. Um, but there was a variation in response and I personally was surprised by what we were getting back because I assumed it would always be about the money. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't always that case. And I think that piece you mentioned about culturally as well, what mm -hmm. they value, I think is a really important piece to explore. Yeah. And I think Thanks. that's why it's so great to, to bring the students into the conversation. If you've got you know, set aside some budget for it. But if you've got space 
to actually have a conversation at the beginning of your engagement or activity with students around what they value. I mean, you can build that into your practice and, and really have it be student led. Um, my only thing with the financial piece is that if financial support sometimes isn't provided, then you are having a group of students that may also um, not be able to participate because of financial reasons. So they have other work obligations, um, can't afford to get to campus that day. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, so it's just about how to, if they've a student with disability, do they have somebody that needs to come with them, extra transport costs? So just taking into those things into consideration on the financial burden. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Oh, great to hear at RMIT there's some central budget coming for that. Yeah, I've, I've just started building it in annually into the student partnerships budget um, so that we're, we're trying to... Um, guide a different department who's in, engaging student voice um mm -hmm. we in the and they they haven't budgeted for it we are able to help out in some small way even if it's like paying for the students catering for the one hour workshop or yeah. something like that um that's really really working well um it's been great to see what what you've put together sarah because we're sort of half three quarters of the way through drafting one ourselves um, and there's some similarities which makes me like, just feel a bit more confident about what we what we where we've landed so far and some inspiration of some some gaps we had so thank you one of the things um, uh, uh, it's kind of like a question or just to let you know what we're doing is we've drafted it so it's for student volunteering in general and that yeah, there's a student yeah. voice thread and then a student community contribution sort of thread to it in terms of that matrix. And I was just wondering, I, I did, did I miss, like, is it, it sounded like it was just student voice activities this was specifically for, is that correct? Um, that's how we framed it because that's what came up in the student consultations and that's where we noticed more discrepancy, I think, in terms of practice across the institution. Yep. So... Um, and the student voice definition is very broad. So um, what we actually put into our matrix, so when we're looking at defining those different activities, we actually have a separate activity that's um, established volunteer programs, and that's things like our, so we've got like a buddy program, our, like all of our really big programs where there's this wraparound compensation that students get, which is around professional development. It's on their transcript. So it still recognises that even though they're, they're doing, you know, more of a recognised volunteer program, um, there still should be some kind of re recognition or reward system in built into that, which could be not necessarily monetary, but all that other stuff that comes with it. So that's how we framed it in ours. Um, so recognising it, but having more of a stronger focus on it being student voice related. But yeah, really good to hear it. I, I've spoken to a few different unis um, during the this period while we've been developing and there actually are a few that are in like the mid stages, like developing a very similar thing. So I, it's funny how it just happens like that. We all start doing the same thing <laughs> in the same year. I'm just reading some comments that have come through. Yeah, great, Elizabeth. I think some of those practices around, you know, formal recognition through certificates, food, they're all things that came up as important as well. When, we, sorry, to jump in, when we um, did that, the focus group with students on what what type of rewards and what motivates them to participate, it was really interesting to um, to hear the primary one was the impact. Mm, yeah, wanting to yeah. have an impact on the the rest of the student community, and yeah. so we're we're really trying to see how we can improve demonstrating the impact of the student volunteering community at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as a engagement strategy with it. Yeah. And I think that makes sense because why do people, you know, engage in volunteer work and do things? It's because they want to contribute back to communities that they feel, whether it be their, their community where they live, their community at university. So um, I think that goes back down to that cultural values piece and like what's important to them. And if it is about, I think that's a great, a great acknowledgement that maybe there is some more socialization that needs to happen in that space around what are they contributing to and what the impact of that is um, as part of that practice. 
absolutely. And anything that people think is missing from that space, because it's still in draft form, so if I'm really happy to and keen to hear ideas. All right, great. Well, yes, very, um, thank you for those who have put some comments in the chat. Um, please do reach out to me if you think of something later on or want to just touch base about it or be part of that network. Libby, you're on the list. <laughs> um, and I'll hand back to, and you've got some questions that you're going to go through. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. This was really comprehensive um, and thank you for sharing as much as you could at this stage with us and I think it again is super relevant and I feel like uh, the discussions we've been having in the network and even individually with people in the room it, it sounds incredibly timely as well to start looking at this uh, and I hope uh, the next part of the session will be um, also useful. Uh, we are not jumping into discussion right away. I do have something to share with everyone, um, which I hope I hope will bring more value as well in the future. Uh, so, what we actually are uh, have been working on at SVA with the working group, and I, I can see that some of the members of the working group, Anthea, Sarah, and Kate. Um, are here today and they've been involved um, since almost the beginning of the year in developing um, student voice uh, rewards survey, which is in final stages of ethics approval. And I feel like I've been saying that in the last two months, but uh, that's what sometimes happens. Um, it's been taking a while and I, I've been more optimistic on timing at the beginning of the year than I am now, but I think uh, we really will have uh, the survey ready to be published soon uh, based on some feedback I've been receiving. And uh, basically what we've done as a working group at SBA is we've uh, decided to do a sector scan into uh, student recognition and reward practices across uh, institutions in Australia and just understand um, uh, not only this survey will provide an actual benchmarking data. So I, um, this is a, is a bit of an um, advertisement for those um, who are considering to maybe fill out this survey when it comes out. And I will I will be in touch with everyone with more information as well when it comes out. But this uh, survey will be providing benchmarking data. And I know a lot of uh, members have been asking me for that. So this is a really good official way for me to collect the benchmarking data around the student voice uh, initiatives across institutions and how it works. So we will be um, uh, collecting that information and alongside that information, we also will be uh, inquiring into all of the approaches into uh, rewarding and recognizing students, uh, student involvement in all of the initiatives. Uh, the uh, At the end of the um, survey, we also have a couple of um, open-ended uh, questions just to um, understand anything else that might, the survey might have missed and um, also just um, see w where everyone is at in terms of challenges or barriers that they've been facing as well as any uh, maybe any future plans already um, and how we can support uh, or create more resources at SVA. Uh, so uh, the the plan is to publish the survey as soon as possible. It's ready to go. We were just waiting for the final approval from ethics and uh, hopefully we'll be doing that as soon as possible this year uh, and into the new year. So there will be enough time for everyone to hopefully fill it out. It's not gonna be too long and too confusing. We've been testing it with some people and it seems uh, easy to navigate. And um. I have two questions, uh, two open questions from the survey uh, published here today, uh, just to kick off a discussion and um, start thinking um, and already discussing, uh, first of all, any um, projects um, or any discussions you already have had in your institution. I can see already in comments, uh, some people have been sort of already answering that question, uh, but I'm open to have this uh, as the actual like discussion in the room, um, to share more um, about your plans or what you've been considering or any inspirations or research you've been doing in implementing uh, reward and recognition of student voice. And uh, the second question, and feel free to, you know, answer either of those 
uh, at any point um, is any anything um, that you might benefit from in particular. Uh, keeping in mind, for example, the survey will provide a lot of data and the data will be um, de-identified. So we won't be identifying any institutions and their names, it's more of a practices. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, to then create a good practice guide out of this, uh, but that will be after we publish a report in the first place. So is there anything else that, that we as a working group could uh, create for you and um, also if you would like to join the working group because we've lost one member uh, recently um, it would be wonderful as well to have more more hands on deck and uh, analyzing and obviously you'll just have uh, quicker access to some of the data um, as well and yeah really keen to hear any of your thoughts or any uh, anything to start this discussion uh, and for those who are, I know sometimes we have a drop out of people as soon as they say word discussion. So uh, if you are here only just to listen, please stay stay and uh, still listen in. I don't judge. Uh, but if you're open to let's talk about this, uh, I'm just going to catch up on comments as well. Also, just uh, seeing that people have been uh, joining the initiative uh, Sarah has mentioned. Um, I think it would be great, Sarah, to be also for, for us at SVA to join you um, in those communities of practice. I think it would be extremely relevant for the working group as well. And um, anything I could contribute from the survey in future, I think would be really fantastic. That would be great. would love that. Thank you. So um, I'm curious, has anyone, uh, if, if there has been any discussions um, and what has been really um, for those who have been sort of having on that on their mind and maybe not as uh, far progressed on creating a, a, a guide at the institution, what sort of barriers have you been facing in uh, developing something like this? And I'm happy to answer that. Um, competing, competing priorities. Yeah. A, a lot of um, like, this is work I was supposed to get done two years ago, <laughs> two or three years ago, um, and so many other, like, you know, compliance or other things come up. And um, this is more seen as nice to have. But like I said, I'm going to use Sarah's lens on it of the, the financial inclusion and, as Kate mentioned, you know, the goal of increasing diversity in student voice to um, just get it over the line and get it, get it out there. Wonderful. And uh, if from the perspective of SVA and knowing that we will be posting a survey like that, uh, is there anything that you would be looking for in particular? In the survey? Like in the results oh. when we publish that or anything supplementary after? Not that I'll, I'll have to have a think on that one. Sorry, Libby's got yeah. your, your hand up. <laughs> hey, Libby. Hey, um, yeah, so I think I, I, I stepped into this role at Curtin about four months ago as coordinator for students as partners. And I think in that short time, I'm aware that we do have different levels of reward and recognition for students that participate in our initiatives here. I'm, I'm aware, I think one of the barriers I mentioned before with, with Sarah is about obviously for the funding for us to have that capacity, but I think it's also about educating staff um, in, I think it's the way they might relate with students that maybe they just assume that they don't need any form of recognition or maybe there's just that education piece because the more conversations I'm having with staff around, have you considered how you're going to reward your students? Um, they go, oh, actually, no, I haven't. Okay, but let, let's look at it. So I think there is an education piece around it. The more conversations you have, um, the more buy-in you'll get. I think in regards to the support from SVA, I know when I'm having conversations, we have a students as partners leadership group. When I'm having those conversations in there, if I start to mention about what other universities are doing, I, I'm aware that interest peaks up. So I think from an SVA perspective, when you're gathering that data, if I have something to present as to what other universities are doing, I think that that also elevates and it gets a better buy-in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, I, I agree with both actually, with educational piece as well. It's, uh, um, I, I know a few people in the room have been uh, struggling with that piece of just even spreading the information and education around even the differences of paid roles, volunteering roles, and um, even the, you know, the definitions that you, Sarah, have been also uh, sharing in your presentation about differentiating the levels of commitment, all of that is is a lacking piece for those who might not have that as their full-time job and just still uh, involving students in our, other capacities. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind as well when we created. Daniela? Hi, Anna. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Sarah. I just wanted to say that was wonderful to see and I'm just echoing Libby's point here. Um, in my role, um, I'm an academic and I work with the wonderful Anthea from the University of Adelaide, who's done amazing work. But it's that that liaison, that bridge between um, these initiatives and then the staff, the academic staff, who they do, it, it, this, this does form um, a part of their core values, but on top of everything else that they are doing, it's just not their priority. So... The more, Anna, to, to answer your question and even to what Sarah's just presented, this is of such high value because now those conversations don't just come from, I guess, you know, me believing in this. There's actually data, there is proof that this is what's currently needed and what we can't go without, that it is our business as usual and that we need to start integrating this into our our policies, our procedures, our approaches to everything. And particularly for us, we're mid-merger now. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to really do things in a, in a better way. Um, so yes, presentations like this. Thank you, Sarah. I've added my name to the list. And Anna, um, just data from SVA to say, here's what I'm talking about. Um, we, we really have um, to listen to this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and to, in you know echoing that, we, we to obtain the data, we do uh, want um, as many responses to the survey as possible. So please, uh, when we see the advertising email, please have a look at it, um, forward it to any of your colleagues who might um, also be able to fill it out. Uh, the survey, and you will see it in the, also in introduction email. The survey is aiming to. Um, do the scope of what your institution is doing overall. But if you don't have, you know, some of the information um, understandably from other departments or other parts of the university, just forward, like if you forward it to them and um, encourage them to also fill out on their side, we have, we will have a better picture um, on what is done in different departments as well. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have um, good comprehensive data overall. And if anyone would like to be part of the um, analyzing and, and report creating uh, team, we still have a working group for that. But if, uh, yeah, if for some reason you still would like to join at this stage, uh, feel free to email me and I will add you and I will catch you up on where we're at as well. Wonderful. Is there any um, any other questions or anything else that comes to mind or any challenge that you feel like uh, you, might be the only one facing that. I I bet you are not. But if is there anything else that's coming up for you that you'd like to raise here? Um, I'll I'll share one that came up um, with some of the work and is still a challenge. We haven't solved it. Um, just institutional practices around payments. So it's actually really difficult to provide kind of small payments to students because of some system issues that we have. So things like gift cards. Banks are now blocking if we buy more than X amount of gift cards. So then that becomes an issue around how we actually provide funding for students um, that engage in these kinds of activities. So what will happen is that often we'll have different areas of the university actually just provide contracts to students for small engagements if they want to make payments. Um, but that's a really high intensive, like a highly intensive process to issue our contracts to a whole bunch of students for a small engagement. And so then it might mean that there's actually a system blocker to be able to provide financial remuneration or a financial reward to students. So it's things that we're investigating internally, but maybe something that people come up across in this, yeah, as a system issue. It's part of that, part of that problem. 
Sarah, I can probably give you just um, a perspective from Griffith. We use gift, um, a company called Gift Pay to yep. issue ours. I don't know if others have used that. Um, but they, they're e-gift cards, but there's hundreds of retailers in, in it. So the students can kind of pick and choose, you know, anything from Coles, Woolies, JB Hi-Fi, Apple, like you name it, hundreds of retailers in there. They specifically have... Um, they're a global company, but they have Australian account managers and they're really quick um, if you set up. So you can set up a global account mm -hmm. um, for your institution and then have sub-users. Um, you can basically buy in advance a, a really large chunk of just like you top up the account and then you assign the card value. Right. It's all you but can bulk upload a spreadsheet of just email addresses and the amount you can customise the message and you can actually, I haven't gone this far, but you can actually customise your gift, gift card. So if you actually want to brand it, they they can work with you in the background. Um, I probably, they should give me a, like a kickback for this sales pitch. Yeah. But, <laughs> what, um, what called? <laughs> it's called G Gift Pay. I'll pop a link in. Thank but you. I found them really great. They, they have some security measures when you buy, but... Um, they'll instantly come back to you if you need to uh, take that off because you, you can do like multi-factor um, on the credit card. Um, they can do invoicing, but I've found them really great and they are working with a number of Australian universities. So I think they're, they're the account man manager is quite kind of up to speed with what, what we need. Yeah, that's great because we have had we have been using Prezi and have actually had, um, if we buy more than X amount of gift cards, it's getting blocked by the banks oh, and then yeah. they block credit cards. So we're having these issues. So we're now thinking about can we actually set up something like what you're explaining, like an institution agreement with a particular gift card issuer so that we don't get blocked so it reduces that barrier of being able to provide financial reward. Um, but, yeah, I've written that down. Thank you. I'll pop, really it, I'll pop it in the chat now for others, but, yeah, I just found it. Oh, and you can do as little as $5 or Great. whatever. So, yeah, it's pretty It's pretty easy. So we've been just on the Prezi thing. I've been using that a lot since the pandemic very much and work a lot with online students. And, um, yeah, the business account is really handy if you can have one of those in Prezi, but you do need to upload the money prior if you you can use credit card through it but you get charged a credit card surcharge in the business account as opposed to the personal accounts great thank you for raising that sarah i remember you mentioned it when we were having our initial like first meeting and um yeah it seems it seems like a big barrier and um not every not every opportunity requires a contract as well but finding ways to still uh, reward students is yeah, important. Thanks for all the suggestions to everyone too. Hopefully one of those options works uh, for you. And yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I will be sharing the recording of this as well to, for you to share with your colleagues and um, the PowerPoint slides. Sarah, do you mind me sharing those in the email at, in the follow-up to this? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks Thank you so much for coming and joining and participating in discussion. I hope you have a wonderful end of the year. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.